separation of variables method for differential equations. To understand this, you already need to know how to do basic derivatives and integrals. You don't actually need to know much about differential equations. This is pretty much the first thing most people learn when they're learning about differential equations, but I have made a couple of really basic videos on the subject that you might want to look at as background for this. So I'm going to do three examples. Here they are. This last example might look like it is the simplest, but it's not. I'm going to go over this in some detail, and I'm going to look at a couple of variations of this, including that right there. That's an important differential equation because this is the basic equation that describes exponential growth and decay. If k is positive, you have exponential growth. If k is negative, you have exponential decay. So this method will only work if you can write your differential equation in this format. Needless to say, it has to be a first order equation and the solution will be in the form of y equaling a function of x. The derivative here has to be equal to a fraction with a function of x on the top and a function of y on the bottom. If you can do that, then you rewrite this in the following way. And what we have over here is the separation of variables. Every expression involving y is on one side of the equal sign. Every expression involving x is on the other side of the equal sign. You're then able to do this. You simply integrate the left side and the right side and then do some algebra. One minor technicality before we move on. I wrote an integration constant over here, but I didn't write it here. You could put an integration constant there. So I have one there and one there, call that C1 and C2. But that doesn't actually help anything because if you were to subtract C1 from both sides, you would have that. And of course, C2 minus C1 is yet another constant, so might as well just have that. So you never need two integration constants, and you can put the integration constant here or here. Usually works out best if you put it over here with the x values. This is the separation of variables method. That's all there is to it. So let's do some examples. So here's the first example. At first glance, it does not look like we have a function of x. We only have a function of y. But we can take care of that. y prime is dy over dx. And then this right side is just equal to that, 1 over y to the power of negative 2. If you don't see a function of x, you can just say the function of x is equal to 1. So now we're going to separate the variables. And you always can do that just by cross multiplying. Now we are ready to integrate. Strictly speaking, you don't have to do this step if you can go straight to this. Many people don't even bother with this step or think about it. What do we have on the left side? Well, the antiderivative of y to the negative 2 power is going to be that. And on the right side, the integral of dx is what? It's the simplest integral there is. It's just x. So there's x plus c. So now let's solve for y. Get rid of the minus sign first. And then y will be this. And that is the solution. That's a general solution. Any possible constant value you can think of, you can substitute into this, and this will be a valid solution. If you had an initial condition, then you would substitute that in for the x and y, and you would solve for c, and that would give you a particular solution. Now, solving differential equations can be challenging, but once you get a solution, it's pretty easy to check that the solution is valid. All you have to do is take the derivative and then double check that it, everything fits the equation. So the derivative of this, well, let's see, we've got a power, we've got this, so how about negative one times 
negative x minus c to the minus 2, do the chain rule on the inside, derivative of negative x to negative 1. So we get this. So we basically got the negative 1 cancels to the negative 1, and we've got that. And I hope you can see that y prime is indeed equal to y squared, because, hey, this thing in here is just negative x to the negative c to the negative 1. I can get this expression two different ways. I can just use my power rules to take this negative 2 power and turn it into a 2 and a negative 1. And you can see that everything inside the bracket is indeed exactly y, and there's y squared. Or the other way I could have done it would be simply to substitute this into here. And as soon as I do that, I've got this, and then I can immediately see that this, in fact, is consistent with that. So here's example two. Y prime, once again, is this. And then on the right side, we now have this. We can cross multiply and get that. We can then integrate. Left side is the same. There's the right side. We'll solve for y again, a similar story to before. I'll leave it to you to demonstrate that this is, in fact, a valid solution. Obviously, you would start by taking the derivative and going from there. See if you can uh, prove that yourself. should be similar to the one we just did. So, here's the interesting equation. There's a lot going on here. What we're looking for is a solution that is equal to its own derivative. Can you think of any functions for which that would be true? Well, you should be able to. How about good old y equals e to the power of x, where e is 2.718, etc. That function is special because it's equal to its own derivative. So it looks like we're done and we don't need to do any work, right? Well, wrong. Let's dig into this and see what happens. When I work through this math, I'm going to make a mistake. And then I'm going to make another mistake that fixes the first mistake, so I'm going to get the right answer. So see if you can spot the mistake for yourself before I tell you what it is. Actually, I'm going to make three or four mistakes, depending on how you're counting. y to the negative 1 is a rather special function. When you integrate that, you can get the natural log of y. On the right side, nothing exciting is happening. Let's keep going. That's what you do when you're trying to solve for a variable that's inside of a logarithm. So we're going to get, so the left side I'll simply change into a y because these will cancel. And on the right side, I'm going to do a little power rule to rewrite this in this format. So where does that get us? Well, it gets us to here. If e is a constant and c is a constant, then e to the power of c is yet another constant. And let's just call that a. So the solution is y equals a times e to the power of x. So while it was easy to see that this was a solution, you might or might not have anticipated that there were other possible solutions. Any variation on this where you have e to the power of x multiplied by some constant will be a valid solution, and it's very easy to take the derivative and show that they're equal. The derivative of a e to the x is a e to the x. So here are some examples of particular solutions. There's an exponential function with an intercept at y equals 3. There's another one. And actually, a equals 0 also gives us a solution. If y is 0, then y prime is certainly 0. So that'll be a solution as well. So, have you spotted the mistake yet? Well, they're all over the place. Here's one mistake. E is a positive number. 
If you raise that to the power of c, that should be a positive number as well. So a should be positive. Negative is no good. Zero, definitely no good. Now, I suppose you could argue, what if c was equal to one half? A power of one half is a square root, and a square root can be plus or minus. Or how about the fourth root or the sixth root? Well, the square root of e is only about 1.6, and the fourth and sixth roots are smaller still, and none of them is ever going to get you a negative 2. And even if you allow that kind of thing, you're only going to have a certain limited set of possible negative numbers, and that doesn't resolve anything. The fact is, any positive or negative a value is a solution, and this can't account for that. And it certainly does not account for a equals zero as well. So that's a one problem. Where did the problem start? It started right about here. This logarithm is only defined if y is positive. If y is zero or negative, this function is undefined. Now up here, this expression is also undefined for y equals zero, just like this, but it's perfectly well defined for negative y values. So if you integrate this to get this, somehow you need to be able to cope for when y is negative. The way you do that is to put absolute value bars on the y. Now this function is defined for any y value, positive or negative, anything other than zero, just like this is and you carry on the absolute value bars all the way through. And when you get down to this step, we have a positive times a positive equals a positive, so this still works. So how do we get from here up to a possible negative? Well, simple enough. Take away the absolute value bars. Now you got plus or minus. And so we'll just say a is a plus or minus e to the c, and now we've got all the possible positives and negatives covered. So we've taken care of most of the problem, but there is still one lingering issue, which is what happens to this when y equals zero? Well, this expression is undefined for y equals zero. So everything from here on down has nothing to do with y equals zero. y equals zero is a special case. But since that's only one possible value, we can check that separately. We can just say, well, um, all of this math is valid for everything other than y equals zero. We'll get this solution. And then we will check the y equals zero case separately. And certainly when y equals zero, y prime equals zero. And so it is a solution. And y equals zero is a valid solution for many differential equations, but not all of them. This surely must look like a lot of fuss to find a solution when we knew the solution already. Honestly, you should just be able to tell by looking at this what the solution is. But let me ask you this. What if we had this? Can you tell what that solution is? Well, you should be able to do that. It's just that. Can you see how that is? because we get a three here, and there, and there, 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 and there, and there's your e to the power of three x. If that wasn't obvious to you, then you would have to work out the math. How about this? Is that solution obvious? Well, it's gonna do the same thing as the three. So it's going to be e to the power of kx. This is your classic example of exponential growth and decay. When k is positive, you have exponential growth. When k is negative, you have exponential decay. What if we have y times x? Is that obvious? It is to me. The solution is one-half x squared. It's the antiderivative of x. If you've got an x right here, you got an x there, you got an x dx, and the antiderivative is one-half x squared, just like we saw in that other example. Here's one more. 
Hmm. Y times cosine of x. What's the solution to that? Work it through. You get e to the sine x. So if you're clever enough to do what I just did, then congratulations. But if you're not, then you just need to work through the steps. So if you appreciated that, please like and subscribe. If you'd like to be tutored online by me personally, I am available until further notice. You can find more information at my website, alternaprof.com. There's a link in the description down below. And here's a couple more links to some of my other videos.